Welcome to As I Live and Grieve, a podcast that tells the truth about how hard this is. We're glad you joined us today. We know how hard it is to lose someone you love and how well-intentioned friends and family try so hard to comfort us. We created this podcast to provide you with comfort, knowledge, and support. We are grief advocates, not professionals, not licensed therapists. We are you. Hi, everyone. Welcome back again as I live and grieve. I so appreciate y'all coming back week after week. And even though I know it's because I have amazing guests and today is no different, somebody did put a little bug in my ear that it could also be because you might have just kind of struck up a relationship with me. Imagine that. At any rate, for whatever reason, thank you so, so much. With me today is Kelly Will, and you are going to find this conversation fascinating. How do I know that? I just know it because (laughs) Kelly is easy to talk to. She's fun. She has a great smile, though you can't see that. So let's get started. Kelly, thanks for joining me today. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. My my pleasure. Mm -hmm. Could you start out first by just telling our listeners a little bit about yourself? Who is Kelly Will? Mm -hmm. Well, I once made a list of all the things that I am and and there's definitely a lot of a lot of labels there but the things that have stayed one of the things that have stayed most consistent is I'm an artist which means ma- mainly writing but I also am a singer I'm also a dancer I am an actress all of these things have been part of you know my my life when I was being educated, but I'm also a healer. I'm a registered reflexologist, a Reiki master, an aromatherapist. I'm a mom. I'm someone who deals with fibromyalgia, so I have experience with chronic pain, and I have a lot of experience with loss, given that I lost a parent. I lost my father when I was 19, and I didn't grieve that one so well, as we were saying. You know, sometimes you grieve, grieve things more productively Definitely. than other times, but then I had a time to catch up. When I lost my spouse when I was three. So I grieved them both then and got on with it because I was then a parent to a one and a half year old. Oh, not easy. (laughs) Yeah. And and grief tends to be an in your face Mm. type emotion, isn't Mm. it? Even if you, even if you have time like I did with my husband, he had a brain tumor. I knew the end was coming. I didn't know exactly when. But I have somewhat of a time frame, and truly, as they decline, you know that it's merely getting closer. But despite that, the moment he took his last breath, that was still an in-your-face moment. Oh, yeah. That I wasn't quite ready for. I went into his room that morning. Somehow I knew that this was going to be the day. I just didn't know when. Yeah. And when it happened, you're almost like, what? 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 Is oh, that it? Ready. Was that it? I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. You know, and and then you eventually have to just face the reality that that's what happened. Now, it always always happens that way because you you can't be prepared. Absolutely. Absolutely. And despite what uh, my experience was known as the anticipatory grief, I knew it was going to happen. Sometimes you don't know it's going to happen. And because we've established this already, grief is different for every single person. It's different for even that person with every instance of grief that they experience because they could be a different age in a different environment in a different relationship whatever it's just going to be different every single time like those pretty little snowflakes we like to think about it's just going to be different and you may or may not be prepared for it yeah but the fact is (laughs) you've got to deal with it now you go ahead. I've got you laughing uncontrollably, and I don't know. <laughs> this, why. Is my sense of, this is my sense of humor. I love the fact that you describe grief as a pretty little, a pretty little <laughs> scattering of snowflakes. Where my mother, who also became a widow when her husband was 52, she describes grief as a pile of shit. Oh, wow. Well, it depends <laughs> on the day. Yeah, it, it depends on the day, but you know, it, it's, it's grief. Grief changes a little bit in that, you know, you'll be walking through the pile of shit. And then one day you'll realize that the pile of shit is at your navel as opposed to yeah, shit. And that's great, but it's still shit. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and you have to figure out how to get rid of it. How to, is that is that like the glass half full or the glass half half empty? And now I don't you know. That's true. That could probably be a whole episode in itself. <laughs> but I want to circle back for a minute to the additional layer of complexity you had in mm-hmm. that not only were you grieving your loss, but you had a child. 
a year and a half old who knows something has happened. Can you kind of let our listeners know what that might have been like? Because I know a lot of listeners are going to resonate. Yeah, of course. I mean, I had some idea of what it would be like for him because I had also lost a parent. My dad was only 52, but when he was tested for prostate cancer, it was already too late to intervene. Okay. Um, so he just had radiation, which was tons of fun. Mm. He also had a heart murmur and started having heart attacks. He was dealing with cardiologists at the same times as, as yeah, Howard. and they didn't always agree. They never they do. They never do because they always want to be the priority. I guess. Well, he ended up with surgery, but because his heart wasn't used to that much flow of blood, he survived the surgery and he went up to our cabin on Manitoulin Island, which is the biggest freshwater freshwater island in the world. It was this happy place. I'm glad he went there because he had a massive heart attack in the middle of the wood and passed away. And my, my grandpa found him and my cousin who was in who was an, uh, an EMT, um, tried, but he was, he was just, he was just gone. And I think he knew, I think he knew that this was, he needed, he didn't want to die at home, but I had no idea. I was in the middle right. of formals and, and my life yeah. school. So I didn't grieve that so well. I just kind of stuffed it down because I went to university the next year. Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, and in truth, that's a lot, a lot of times when we're kids, that's what our parents want us to do. They want us to just move on quickly. They don't want us to be barred by grief. They don't want us to experience all of the hurt. So they encourage us to just move on. Right. Yeah. Which is unfortunate because even though I was 19, and I think a fairly young 19 because I had been to an all-girls school all of my life. I lived in a kind of little plaid bubble. It didn't mean I didn't have to feel those things. It just meant that it hurt more because I had to drag them up from the bottom and feel them longer. So it was better, you know, and it was uh, me to grieve that. So I went to university and my professor was Judith Thompson, who is a a very well-known Canadian playwright who is all about death or who is all about, so I did so much work on, and it just came up in my acting classes in everything yeah. because the woman did not do comedy. Yeah. She was the one who said, Kelly, go home, go see your mother. For God's sake, you are, you're grieving. Like, so it was kind of a shock that, that something I thought was invisible. My professor was saying, Kelly, get your head out and you need to see it. And I started seeing an ecumenical counselor. My, my pain got so bad that I almost dropped out of third year university. Wow. I got so depressed, scared the hell out of my mother because I said, I never want to write again. I never want to be in another production again. So I went to a fibromyalgia day clinic where they taught me to pace and advocate for myself and get out of the very negative relationship I was in at that point. And I got better and I got interested in the holistic field. And I went from the arts to wellness and I came to Toronto and I eventually became a practitioner. I eventually came out because I realized I was bi and I was interested in women. And then I met my wife. Yeah, there you go. Because I started saying no to the things that didn't work for me. And there was Kara. I love this story so much. You know, one of the things I talk about is I use the analogy of a chrysalis. And, you know, caterpillars go into, oh, I didn't want to make you spit out your coffee. I'm sorry. Caterpillars go into the cocoon because it's part of their life. You know, it's just like all of a sudden here we have a grief experience that's part of our life. And I can imagine that the time period in the cocoon where you you completely want to isolate yourself, block yourself off, your body is going through all of these horrible, horrible changes. And then somehow you kind of get it all together and here you come transformed as a butterfly or a moth. I mean, maybe you're not a spectacularly vivid butterfly, but you could be a moth. But I fucking fabulous when I get out. I, 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 but I just love that analogy and the, and the way you describe your own transformation. You you seemed to somehow through healing find out who Kelly really yeah. is, and you accepted that. You allowed others to see that. In your vulnerability, you said, here I am. And you found, you found your community. I did. I love that. Well, it gets even more interesting than that, Kathy. I cannot oh, keep going. Cannot believe that you referenced to Chrysalis because there is a section in my book that is called Breakdown uh-huh. because I was 
fascinated with butterflies. So part of my Reiki practice is to work with totems, with energy from to a person for their psychological understanding of what this is in the form of an animal, because animal instincts, they're very, very simple. It's like, does yes. wolf, do wolf do that? Right. A butterfly is big sweeping change. Mm -hmm. I found a dying monarch on the pavement. Ben and I found a dying monarch on our way home on the sidewalk, and it was going to die. I knew that. All we could do was pick it up and take it. And that's when I really started to connect with the universe, knowing that there were things that were put in my, literally put in my path. In your path. path. Right. Just to say, okay, my life has gone to shit. I have to pay attention to the things around me because I know someone is trying to give me a hand up. Yep. I know that because I was already established as a Reiki master. So I tried to just trust and I was obsessed with butterflies because the question that the section of the book is basically when a, when a caterpillar goes into a cocoon, does it know what's going to happen? Right. Or does it have to just trust? It has to just trust. It's instinct. It would feel wrong to do anything else. When a caterpillar, excuse me, goes into the chrysalis, what happens? The caterpillar is no more because it right. actually has to break down cell by cell by cell. Yes. The big thing. Yeah. And one little ooze. It has to completely obliterate everything that it was before right. in order to transform into something completely new. And this is something that, that biology does. This is not magic. This is suck. And it's like, I was so obsessed with it because I felt like grief was my shell. Mm -hmm. And what I was going to have to do was be ready to break down. Yeah. Ready to give up anything that was serving me, give up anything to, even though I was afraid, even though I was sad, even though I was scared that I couldn't parent on my own, I had to say, screw it. I'm ready to break down. Right. I will give up everything I need to give up in order to decide where I'm supposed to go from here. And I'm not, I'm going to stop questioning myself. Right. And for me, that moment was when I said to myself, I cannot live like this anymore. Yes. I do not want to feel this pain. I do not want to isolate myself. I do not want to live like this for the rest of my life. So that was my turning point. Yes. And everybody, it's it's the dark night of the soul. If you're talking about literature, it's where everything is flattened and yes. you have to decide. And it's it's amazing. So Samantha with the, at the BFO, she asked me a question. She said, oh, I have a book launch that's coming up. And she said, our members are going to want to know how you coped with grief. And I think mm -hmm. no one had ever really asked it in the way that she asked it, but I thought about it and I said, because I decided to. You have no choice. You don't have a choice. You either decide to cope with this, you decide that this is not the end of your life, or you don't. Right. You decide to throw out the things that are in your way and get mm -hmm. things that work better. Yes. And go on, or you don't. And that's a hard answer because it's on you. It's not on the people. Exactly. Out. Exactly. Exactly. Any mental health wow. change, behavior, grief is just an emotion. Yeah. One of the most devastating and it, and it so involves so many things, but it doesn't change how right. you have to learn right. to cope with a trauma. Right. Right. And now, back to Ben and then him cope, yeah. they knew stuff was going to be, ha he was going to be going through this and he was going to be going through it alone. So kids, when they're exposed to trauma that young, there's a number of things that, the, that my doctor explained to me that could happen. And it was there, his eating habits went to hell. He was in my bed for a good, you know, couple of months and both of us needed that. So that was okay. He eventually sure. went back. Sure. And forth. But when he started to, when he was supposed to have started to develop language that didn't happen, was speaking with his tongue and his jaw as one unit. Okay. So we were speech pathology for years to get him. They actually like touched his, his mouth to show him how, where the sound came from and how to, with, with his muscle. So he, but then after that, we also learned that he's like me. We both have ADHD, which is what we discovered. We, our literary comprehension is like this, but so was his and he couldn't talk. Uh, he's so angry. And I do not blame him for sure. one more, like in grade <laughs> one, when he was shoved into a classroom with 25 other kids, he had a moment where he had a rage and he ran through the class throwing chairs and computers and person that I lived with for six years after, she was the one who drove me to go get him because I didn't even have my life at that point. So I had to go in and take him home for lunches because he wasn't allowed to be there. So yeah. we, need, I, we needed to get a psychotherapist for him to kind of help him through those emotions. Yeah. And, 
from how to express them, especially with his the disadvantage of, right. of verbal communication being there. Right. Right. Um, and then we dealt dealt with the dyslexia. And then over the pandemic, we worked with a clinic that knew how to teach people with dyslexia and he learned how to read. And once he learned how to read, it was like a lock was wow. out. And now he's top of the class. Excellent. And it's, you can get them in the right environment. And I was very lucky that DSB, the, the Trowister School Board, has right. ex- special education classes and teachers now and they can write that mode on. You yeah. know, when am I going to get into a real school? Because I can handle <laughs> I know you can, babe. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, it's that difficult because I didn't realize what huge my executive functioning is awful. I can <laughs> nobody's business, but sometimes I can't read a clock. Yeah. It's not just grief, it's living with the disadvantages of having to try to do something differently. But sure. those are also superpowers. Like, Absolutely. You know, I wrote I wrote a six hundred page novel during the pandemic, so I didn't go crazy. Yeah. My that was my next question, by the way. As I've heard you reference book, book launch, and everything like that. So I, I want to wrap up about your son, and I want to talk about the book. Let's do, yeah. So that was a surprise. I didn't see that coming on the other side of the cocoon. You didn't sit down with the intention of writing a book? Oh, oh I always sit down with the intention of writing a book. Okay. But the way that this developed was completely unique for me. So after Kara died, I felt like I just needed to be visible as an artist. I was kind of living under a microscope because I was only 34. Ben was only one and a half. Everybody was crazy worried about us. Everybody was crazy shocked and angry and didn't know what to do. Mm-hmm. And my writing coach that I had actually found just previous to meeting Kara, mm-hmm. these are the mistakes, yeah. offered me a free blog writing workshop. What? So, okay, get me out of the house, sure. get me in front of a computer. And yeah. the prompt was create a fictional character and blog with them. But I was like, oh, well, I want to do a serious, like, poetic, angsty blog. Well, of course, of course you do. You know what? It, I was going to write a book yeah. for a year because that's dumb because you've never been able to, you've never been able to do less at a time in your life where you need to do more. Right. So I thought that was quite, and then all of a sudden I had this superhero in my mind and I straightened up and I anchored my hands and my hips and I took a stance and I went, fuck <laughs> I'm like, what? I'm like, I don't, I don't need angst and poetry. I mean, I do need angst and poetry. Sure, sure. But I need a fucking superhero. Yeah. Yeah. Completely narcissistic and self-involved and unapologetic who will not allow me to grieve politely because right. that is awful. Yeah. And it will also give me a place that I can swear a yeah. lot yeah. away from my child when he goes yes. to sleep. Yeah. So, I, so suddenly it's like one of those, one of those lightning moments of a door just opened. Yeah. And she is somebody that I can always blame because she's a jerk and I could always have a conversation with her. I can always have an argument with her and she will always be on my side, even if she's taking pot shots at me, mm-hmm. because I'm going to give myself space to mm-hmm. talk about where there was none before. Yeah. I love that you personify grief. Yes. I personify a lot. I make a lot because of- grief does take on a life of its own, a character of its own. Yeah. She is and like- especially when you consider that as we grieve, we often have two different personas. Mm-hmm. We have the one when we're at home by ourselves, isolated, and we can sob uncontrollably all day. We can be angry and throw things and cuss and and just be, you know, we do all of those things. Yet when we grab our purse and step out the front door and get in the car, yeah, the man side. Uh, you know, uh, someone will say, oh, Kathy, how are you today? I'm fine. Wait, you know, I'm Sometimes you can be fine. Yeah. And that's allowed. Like, yeah. that was the other part of it is that this was going to be so extreme. It was going to be stupid because Kara's adage was you always have the choice to laugh. She made me laugh even when I didn't want to. Yeah. And I wanted to smack her for it. Uh-huh. But it's like, you know what? If I'm going to survive this, the best part of my relationship with my wife was how much fun we had. And she's still sh- sitting on my shoulder. Of course she is. On my shoulder. <laughs> it's well, me. On my shoulder. On the you and go. And Captain Grief comes in and looks at me at the stage that I'm in crying on the kitchen floor and says, get up, pathetic. We're going to Walmart. So she she's 
smacks that kind of stuff out of me and says, you are still allowed to have fun. You are still allowed to laugh. In fact, you need to laugh more. And you know what? Ironically, it's it's very convenient that a lot of things about death are stupid and you wouldn't think that you have to deal with them, but you do, you know? Yeah. For example, you come home with a box of your wife. What do you do with it? Yeah. What do you do with it? Well, well and it's counter next to the cookies. And then you take the box of your cat and you put the cat on top of her box and you imagine them fighting in the afterlife because they hated each other. And you felt <laughs> that it's not a Yes. Yeah, so and I remember leaving the funeral home and I had been given the box with Tom's ashes in it. And I stood by my car just kind of looking in all directions. And my younger daughter, Kelly, said to me, Mom, what was the matter? I said, well, I can't put him in the trunk. <laughs> you know, so I put him in the back seat, and then I'm thinking, should I put the seatbelt around him? I, you know, you just you just totally freeze at those moments, you know. But you're right, and those are stupid things when you look back on them. But at the moment, I was paralyzed. I really was, and that that's the thing is like in those moments, did you did I ever think that I would be in this position? Well, I never thought I would. I mean, I knew that at some point this would happen, but now it's here. It's completely surreal, and I have to do. Exactly. And this is hilarious. I'm going to laugh later about this. You know, that's exactly. so, and, and especially people who would come into the kitchen and look over at Kara's urn and look back at me and then double take and realize what I've done. And I would break up. I'm like, oh, you know what? I deserve to laugh about this because absolutely. I have. Absolutely. 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 No? Yeah, yeah. But sometimes we get so caught up in our own devastation that we don't allow ourselves to do that. Or the first time we laugh in our grief, we feel so guilty. You know what? For me, I was glad. That, I mean, I'm a storyteller. And Kara and I always competed in telling stories and telling funny stories. And we have so many funny stories that the thing we did, because this is what we did for my dad, we were used to telling funny stories of how he was an engineer and he measured everything and everything had to be a straight line and poke fun at him. So as soon as Kara died, we got right into that where we were telling the funny right. stories about my grandmother trying to figure out whether Kara was a woman. Right. And not yeah. really, you know, uh -huh. into that. So I was already integrated into the gallows she yeah. had. It was already comfortable. Right. So I just, we just started to do that. And that certainly didn't mean that I wasn't on the floor crying because I guarantee you, I was. But when I stood up again, I could talk to my mom who was a widow and she'd be like, yeah, that's normal. Yeah. Can you think of any tips? And I've heard the term gallows humor before. And it, you know, it's one of those phrases that you think, hey, that's uncomfortable. But... <laughs> There, there is, and and like Kara said, you do have a choice to laugh, and laughing can be so therapeutic. So, can you think of any tips, perhaps, or advice you could offer to our listeners that might be afraid to laugh? Maybe they're in that devastating phase of their grief that just laughing seems like something they will never do again. Can you think of anything to encourage them? Yes. The grief is not, the grief is there for the rest of your life. If you take a break to go to a stupid movie, it's going to be waiting for you at the door of the movie theater. It's not going anywhere. And you can't grieve 24 7. You can't do that because your life is continuing. So I celebrated the stupid videos that she would, of her dancing around the kitchen with a whole bunch of fruit on her head. I allowed myself, in, those things may have also made me cry, but I had to know that they were there. The story, she may have been gone, but the best stories about her were still there. Right. And they were still funny as hell. They were even funnier because we could tell them to new people. Mm -hmm. And they're like, your grandmother did what to Kara? Yep. And it would just, it becomes when you're, it, it depends on the perspective from which you're telling you the story. If you're telling it from a, this was so funny, it's you become different. When you laugh, something energetically changes and it shifts something and you get a break. So yes. do be afraid to give yourself a break from grieving and do not be afraid to say anybody who's looking at me and telling me I'm grieving wrong, fuck them. Yeah. Because this is your grief. It was your relationship. You cannot anybody else's opinion of how you are grieving deter you from doing what you need to do. And that was right. the primary function of yeah. she didn't give a rat's ass about yeah. anything else. And she gave me the things, access to the, the types of emotions and the types of plans that I, I didn't think I had access to or ability right. to right. Right. that moral superpower. And I realized I'm Captain Grief all along. Yeah, I just, in the transformation, I just got 
her. Yeah. And, and I played the best parts of her. Yeah. yeah. And I, I I got to play her in a theater. And I feel like this freaking time of my life. I'll bet. I'll mm-hmm. bet. Yeah. And, you know, and this taking a break from grief, it can be a split second of time. Yeah. We're not necessarily saying, all right, 30 minutes on the clock, sit down, take a break. Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily that. It can just be one spontaneous yeah. last. Yeah. And heaven knows. You don't have to go to a theater because the internet's full of this stuff. Actually, TikTok, from that videos, tip the TikTok. Don't you dump cat videos? Anything you want. There are so many opportunities out there that you can just watch something that eventually may force a laugh out of you. Yeah, like try you know try not to laugh at this. And or the time right. when you eat that dish, you yes. reference. There's a whole thing. It, yeah, a whole thing called if it don't if it don't if it ain't break or if it sorry if it ain't broken break it. Yes. You know, yes. My Reiki master said, you know, do this and do this and do this, Kelly. And I think you break something. Pardon? Yes. What? And there are even establishments out there now where you I can know take sledgehammers to things exactly. and break exactly. them and do demo work or something like that. Yeah. There are opportunities out there to channel that anger and frustration you have. Well, this the, the blog brought things to me, like a listener that I just started to know well showed up on my doorstep after going to. Value Village with a whole bunch of dishes. Oh my gosh! And champagne glasses for me to break. Well, because I did that one post about breaking a dish and feeling free. Yeah, and I was picking up the basement and I wiggled the shelf and a bunch of champagne glasses fell and they make yeah. the best shattering. Noise. Yes, they do that tinkly shattering yeah. type. Yeah. Like, oh well, I guess I break the rest of the dish. <laughs> well, broke it all, and my mom was upstairs going, "Kelly, what's going on down there? Nothing." Goosh. I said that. I just stay with that, you know. Therapy. Therapy. Oh, they're so you know, many. Personally, I prefer to go somewhere that somebody else has to clean up. I don't have to mess. clean it up. Oh, absolutely. But, absolutely. but in a, you know, my point is that sometimes if you allow yourself or even force yourself to take a break from that devastation, yeah. you may find that will help you take one step forward yeah. in your path and realize that, oh, all right, nothing, nothing horrible happened. Yeah, it doesn't exactly. pop up. I didn't exactly. Hell, where that? You know, I'm not being punished. Okay, yeah. let me try that again. You know, and all of a sudden, you might find that makes you feel a little bit better, and that's perfectly okay. It's one of these things where you have to. And somebody said this to me: grief is not a passive experience. Mm-hmm. It requires action, and you are the only one that can take that action. Yeah. So if if you decide to do nothing, it's passive and you're going to be stuck where you're stuck. If at some point you decide to take action, even if it's one simple champagne flute that you smash (laughs) or one simple dumb cat video that you watch on TikTok and laugh about, whatever it is, that one simple little action Mm -hmm. can make a world of difference in your, I hate to say recovery, because that would imply that we could recover from grief. Well, we do in, it, we do it in some ways. It, it proves you have a choice. It's not a great choice. I call it, I call it difficult opportunity. Yes. You have a very difficult opportunity to say, right now, I'm going to sit on the floor and I'm going to cry because right. I need, and then I'm going to sit up and I'm going to make a take. Yes. You know, like cake is a, is a, I guess a third main character in my book. We yeah. Have- ourselves to do both of us what we needed to do if we needed to hang on to that bedspread we did if we needed to buy a new new bedroom furniture yeah i did yeah may not make sense and the way you cope with grief may not make sense on the outside to somebody yeah. because, because it's your emotional experience yes yeah, yeah. Well, it's okay your... i am going to announce create a new therapeutic process <laughs> for grievers this is the kelly wilk method or maybe Captain Grace, I don't know. But it's that you make a statement, you make an affirmation that says, I will allow myself to blank, do this. For example, sit on the floor sobbing. You break a champagne. I will allow myself to do this. Insert action. Yes. And then, so this is the Kelly Wilk and then method. <laughs> and then I will do this action. So it's like a contract with yourself. You're going to allow yourself this moment of devastating grief, whatever it is, sobbing uncontrollably, not taking a shower, not cooking for yourself, exactly. yes. not not cleaning the living room. I'm going to allow myself to do this. 
Kathy and Ann, then. Book. And then. I am yeah. going to love your book, and I can't wait to read it. <laughs> so, absolutely, all that. But So, this is the Kelly Wilk and then method. Try I was going to make a list because the big thing that Captain Grief and I do is we make a list. 12 uh-huh. things you can get away with. Uh, you normally I love should, it. which you can get away with when your spouse dies. You can I love it. Breakfast. I love it. Oh, oh. got a shower for 10 days. You can take pole dancing lessons. Uh-huh. You can make a list of all the things that you wanted to do because honestly, what the hell do you have to lose? Yeah. I learned to watercolor. Awesome. With watercolor. Amazing. You know, uh, so many things. So I am going to allow myself to do this. And then, well, sad to say, our time is running down. Sorry, this was so fun. This, I know. This has been fun. It just means we're going to have to do it again. But mm-hmm. uh, but right now, this is the time where I turn the microphone over to my guest because throughout the podcast, I interrupt all the time. I ask a question. I make a comment about my own personal life. But this is your time, Kelly, and I'm going to turn the microphone over to you to speak directly to our listeners. The floor is yours. It's funny that I just got nervous for a second. It's like, I'm going on stage. Wait, no, I've always been on stage. I am the stage. I am the show. Okay. Yeah, well, there was a very long time that I was not sure that this book, The High Flying Adventures of Captain Grief, was going to happen because it's a bit odd. I'll grant it. I mean, it, it definitely made people, you know, look sideways at what I was doing. There were actually people at that point that that were angry with me and they didn't understand what I was doing. And they only told me that like years later, you know, I'm glad they would, I'm glad they waited. So I tried to get this thing published for two years and people loved it, but they didn't know what to do with it because it was not, you know, there was, it was so many things. So I decided to, to consider self-publishing, but not seriously, seriously until a client of mine actually mentioned Iguana Publishing, which is a publishing, like a hybrid publisher. And obviously I didn't have the money to, to do this. So what Greg from Iguana said is we are not, you know, in the business of, of hacking into our writers, you know, savings, do a Kickstarter. So I did a Kickstarter and in 30 days I rose, I, I raised, sorry, $5,000 which is paying for the editing, the designing. I have an illustrator, but the creation of this book, the distribution of this book, and suddenly the Kickstarter worked and now it's going to happen. And I can't believe that just because I decided to kind of follow my gut on this, even that even though it led to some very bizarre places, it worked. It worked. And now it's a reality. I can see the pictures. I know what it's going to look like. And on the 20th, of June, it's 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The bereaved families of Ontario has hired me, I guess, to do what is called a grief talk. So I'm going to be talking about a lot of these things to the members of this peer group. And if you, there are these types of groups all over, but in Ontario, this is one that you can get involved in, which is peer support, which, you know, this is the recipe of grieving. You need community. You need to find the community. And this is one way to connect. So I'm going to be reading parts of my book. I'm going to be talking about grief. And then my book is going to go on sale. And then on the 26th of June, um, I'm having an, an in-person launch and it's kind of more like a, a halftime show. <laughs> I'm taking the opportunity to have guests come and sing. I'm going to be doing a performance. I'm going to really be kind of demonstrating the nitty gritty of what it was like to write the blog, The High Flying Adventures of Captain Grief, and the physical copies of my books are going to then also be on sale. And I, I can't wait. It's This is the celebration that I've been waiting for since Kara died 11 years ago. And I, wow, and really enjoy me for, you know, if, if you can't come to the live one, please you know, it's free. Anybody can sign up. As soon as I send out the invite, I can I can send it to Kathy. I can put it on my my feed. I have a Facebook group called the High Flying Adventures of Captain Grief, which you can join. Okay. And you know, there's resources. There's uh, there's stupid stuff. There's those cat videos. You know, like anything that you might need in your term of grief. <laughs> um, I'm hoping to create a space where people, just like it happened when I was blogging the first time, people arrive at the space where it's okay to laugh about grief. It's okay to talk about grief because everybody who's in that community understands and you do not have to explain yourself. Those are the places that a grieving person needs to find. So I'm really, really hoping that putting my journey in this form can take that to somebody else who needs it. And then I'm asking to show up of service in the world. I'm writing. Amazing. The High Flying Adventures of Captain Grief. That is the very first thing that caught my attention. (laughs) 
that made me think, is this person? I have to get to know her. And boy, am I so glad I did. So Kelly, I can't wait for the book. Um, I I have a stack of books in my to be read bio. It always happens. But yours will quickly rise to the top like cream, because I'm so excited and so eager to read it. So to our listeners, we want to again say thank you. We want to remind you of the very new, you heard it here first, Kelly Wilk and Then Method for for healing in your grief journey. Yeah. And, you know, back up a little bit in the podcast and listen to it again, if you like. And if for some reason, and I can't imagine anybody just listens to the end of a podcast, that doesn't happen. But should you have just kind of all of a sudden decided to listen, you want to catch that, the Kelly Will End Then Method. I love it. And I'm going to advocate it from here on out. Just as I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to advocate her book. I'm going to advocate her. And as soon as I stop the record button, I have like three or four creative ideas I have to throw her away because my mind has just been exploded as we've been talking today. This has been a wonderful conversation I have thoroughly enjoyed. I hate to see it come to an end. I do want to do it again. Absolutely. We will. It'll be on the books. I do want to remind our listeners that self-care is vital when you're grieving. And Kelly mentioned as well, and I want to reiterate that community, community is part of self-care. Surround yourself with a community that will support you, that will help you, that will not judge you, yes. that will allow you to be you in your grief, whatever that looks like, whenever that's what you need. Self-care. And there's a term for that. There's a term for that. It's it's when you are a healer, you hold space. Hold space. You have to be ready to. It's not about you. It's about the person that you are holding space for. And that's what I do with my clients. But when someone is holding space for for your grief, it's the same thing. Yep. You have to feel safe in that space to fall apart, to laugh, to do whatever you need to do. And that's why you need community because you need people that have experienced grief themselves and understand how vital vital it is to have that cocoon, to have that space yes. around the grieving process because it's fragile. Yes. And it's not well said. And this is a space where we hold grief. As I Live in Grief has a Facebook page, I will be making sure, if I haven't already, that I visit and join the High Flying Adventures of Captain Grief on Facebook. And you know what, everybody? You should too. <laughs> on that note, please join us again next time. Thanks for being here today as we all continue to live in grief. And Kelly, thanks so much for being you. Thank you for being you. Thank you so much for listening with us today. Do you have a topic that you'd like us to cover or do you have a question from one of our episodes? Please email us at info at as I live in com and let us know. We hope you will find a moment to leave a review, send an email and share with others. Join us next time as we continue to live and grieve together.